Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for those introductions to President Wood, to Reverend Brickett Wagner, Dr. Wagner, the Phipps, everyone who's made this possible. Thanks for this opportunity um, to invoke some either 80s or 90s pop culture. I, I feel I'm not worthy right, uh, <laughs> to be here, but nonetheless, I'm grateful to be here and to have an opportunity to speak with you about what is a very challenging topic. Uh, let's sell newspapers and attract viewers to their websites and visitors to the websites by making a link between Islam and violence. Hollywood sells movie tickets by linking Islam with violence. We don't have a problem in the United States, or in Europe for that matter, when it comes to connecting Islam and violence. In fact, we're so obsessed with linking these two that one of our favorite pastimes is to single out Muslims after terrorist attacks have taken place and to ask them to condemn terrorism and to condemn violence that they've had nothing to do with. And this, too, happens across the political and the ideological spectrum. New York Times, Fox News, take your pick. I can find journalists on left-leaning sites, right-leaning sites. I can find politicians who are on the left or the right, and I can just find lots of variations of this. The same thing. Prominent politicians, prominent journalists asking Muslims, why aren't you condemning terrorism? Why don't you speak out more against terrorism? Where is the moderate Muslim? We will not solve this problem until the moderate Muslim starts to speak out. This is not hard to find examples of this. And what I will be arguing tonight is that we need to stop doing this. Stop it. Stop asking Muslims to condemn terrorism. And there are three reasons I'm going to put forth why we need to stop doing this. And these three reasons structure the book that Dr. Wagner mentioned in his introduction, my book, Presumed Guilty, that came out last month. And it will be the same three reasons that structure my talk. The first being, asking Muslims to condemn terrorism wrongly assumes that Islam is the cause of terrorism. The relationship between religion and violence and terrorism is pretty complicated, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it's a false assumption to think that Islam is the cause of terrorism. That's the first problem with asking Muslims to do this. The second problem is that when we ask Muslims to condemn terrorism, we are ignoring, blatantly ignoring, the many, many, many occasions in which Muslims are condemning terrorism and pretending as if we don't know it. Or maybe not pretending, we're just ignorant and don't know it. By the way, the problem is not with Muslims, but with the rest of us. Third, and I'm going to argue most importantly, when we ask Muslims to condemn terrorism, when we obsess about Muslims and their need to condemn terrorism, what's often happening is that we are diverting attention from violence that's part of our past in the non-Muslim majority, and frankly, in some cases, as part of our present. But as long as we're thinking about them, we don't need to turn the critical eye on us. And that's a problem. Now, I will address all three of these and give some illustrations of why these are all problematic assumptions. But um, for the purpose of the talk, I'm going to focus a lot more on one and three. I'll briefly touch on number two. In the book, I go into more length on all three of these. But, but uh, it's numbers one and three that I want to spend the most time on. And what connects all three of these together, by the way, is the presumption of guilt. This, this, this notion, sometimes articulated, oftentimes implicit that Muslims are inherently prone to violence, inherently prone to terrorism, and therefore they should be collectively presumed guilty. In a way that I would not be assumed guilty if someone from my religious, cultural, racial, ethnic background committed a horrific act of violence. I don't bear the sins of my people in the same way that Muslims are asked to bear the sins of their people. Right. Two caveats before I move forward. First, I'm already using this language of we, which can be problematic. Who am I talking to or about? Well, it's not an all-inclusive we. By we, I particularly mean the non-Muslim majority, and even more particularly, I'm referring to whites and speaking to whites and white Christians, or people with a white Christian cultural background, and I'm speaking to this 
group of people largely because I think we are the ones who have the most difficulty getting a lot of this. We're the ones who have the most difficulty self-reflecting and self-critiquing when it comes to violence. And therefore, we need to hear this message the most, in my opinion. The other thing I want to say before I move forward is, before my book even came out, I was catching a little bit of flack because a lot of people were assuming I was saying, or was going to say, that Muslims shouldn't condemn terrorism. And please note, I have not said that at all. It's not in the book title that you have in front of you, or had in front of you. It is uh, not anywhere written in the book. It's not anywhere going to come out of my mouth tonight. Of course, Muslims should condemn terrorism. <clears throat> we should all condemn terrorism. We should all condemn unjust violence, no matter who the perpetrator is. My point is that we should stop asking Muslims to condemn terrorism under the assumption that they are already guilty of harboring terrorist or violent tendencies until they somehow prove to the rest of us otherwise. That is a double standard and a level of hypocrisy that the non-Muslim majority, and particularly whites and white Christians, do not have to face. And I certainly do not have to face. That's my larger point. Now, having set that up, let's get into this first issue of why we should not ask Muslims to condemn terrorism. Because it wrongly assumes that Islam is the cause of terrorism. If you study the scholarship on terrorism, and I'm not talking about the people who show up on CNN every now and then, or Fox News or whatever, right? but people actually study this as scholars for a living, particularly social scientists, you will find many of them, no matter what their particular differences might be, draw some general conclusions that they share. One of which is that we must pay attention to the political factors that drive terrorism. That politics matters, and in fact, in all the cases, much more central to understanding terrorism than religion is. And to understand this, you in part need to just simply read the statements of terrorists, particularly terrorist organizations, who frequently are alluding to or explicitly pointing out political motivations and factors driving their violence. So you have Osama bin Laden here, and these statements from him are a dime a dozen. This notion that Al Qaeda is responding to U.S. imperialism, U.S. perceived U.S. occupation of Saudi Arabia, U.S. foreign policies when it comes to uh, acquisition of oil and energy resources, exploiting Muslim nations or Arab nations. Uh, Al-Qaeda has tons of statements like this over the years, and, and Bin Laden has no trouble invoking this. He's not just opening up the Quran and quoting it. He is, he is responding to very particular political circumstances, which doesn't justify the violence at all, but it helps us understand it better. And name the major terrorist organization, uh, whether it's ISIS, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, their leaders tend to use these kind of statements, referring to very specific political conditions. Moreover, on this topic of politics, there is a political scientist named Robert Paik. He has studied suicide terrorist bombings going back to 1980, I think, going into the 21st century. And what he has found is that when the motive can be discerned, usually when the bomber says why they're doing what they're doing, or leaves a videotape or a note or whatever, in over 95% of the cases, the reason they are giving is some sort of response to real or perceived occupation. It could be occupation in the Holy Land, it could be occupation in Saudi Arabia, whatever. But it's, it's a response to that. Now, none of this means that religion has a factor into it. That's not my argument. I should have reset my computer settings earlier, my apologies. Uh, religion does factor into it, but it's not the driving force, is, is the point of many of these scholars. And I do talk about that in my book, and I also talk about not just political factors, but social factors. And I don't have as much time tonight to go into those, but the short version is that for many people who are also recruited into these terrorist organizations and who are attracted to them, uh, a lot of what attracts them to them is a sense of meaning, uh, a, a quest for purpose. Uh, oftentimes these are dis disaffiliated, disoriented, disgruntled young men uh, who don't have a sense of belonging, particularly if they're coming from Europe or the United States. And organizations like ISIS are brilliant at recruiting people who feel that way. If you don't belong in Britain, if you don't feel like you belong in Germany, if you don't feel like you belong in the United States, come join ISIS. Come join this brotherhood. Come join this family that you don't feel that you have where you're at. We will give you a sense of belonging. We will give you that sense of family. We will give you a purpose. And those social factors are also something that comes up over and over again with scholarship. Again, it doesn't mean religion has nothing to do with it. Religion oftentimes gets factored in as a justifier. 
that's a different point to make than saying that religion is the cause. Another factor to consider in terms of this false assumption that Islam causes terrorism is the level of religious illiteracy that many terrorists or would-be terrorists actually have. A lot of would-be terrorists who want to join organizations like ISIS or Al-Qaeda actually know very little about Islam. And many of them aren't particularly observant and practicing Islam. And this is something we find in study after study after study. Britain's MI5, counterintelligence agency, found this, uh, had this conclusion back in 2009, uh, that most terrorists know little to nothing about Islam. Uh, the United Nations has had a study. Oxford scholars have had a study. I can think of a lot of them. And they come to almost the same conclusion, that a lot of terrorists, a lot of would-be terrorists, aspiring terrorists, don't know much about Islam and haven't been particularly observant in practicing it until they're being recruited. Now, the story I'd like to tell to illustrate this comes from 2013. In 2013, we had two young men from Birmingham, England, childhood friends, grew up as best friends. As young men, they decide they want to travel to Syria and join basically what we would think of as a violent jihadist organization that has loose affiliations with Al-Qaeda. So, they make the decision to go to Syria. They take, spend some time getting the money it takes to make the trip. They get their affairs in order. And then before they leave, they get on Amazon.com. And they order a couple of books. You want to guess what they order? Islam for dummies. And the Quran for dummies. Two books, by the way, I would never assign my students. Much better books in Islam out there than these two, right? But why would two Muslim men who've already made the decision to go to Syria to fight for this organization have to get on Amazon and order books like this. Now, if you're operating assumptions that Islam is the cause of terrorism, this doesn't make sense. And so at the time, in 2013, when, the, when this came to light, uh, you had journalists and you had politicians scratching their heads like, well, this doesn't make sense. But if you understand the scholarship on this, it makes perfect sense. We have plenty of studies. We had studies then, we have studies now, confirming this. A lot of these folks don't know much about Islam. In fact, there's a good reason to suggest that if they knew more about Islam, they would be less likely to be recruited. That a, a literacy of Islamic text and tradition actually helps provide a bulwark against being recruited. So something to think about when we think about this Islam cause terrorism. And why order dummies books? Another piece of this puzzle is context and understanding not only this deaths from terrorism, both in the United States and in Europe, but deaths from violent deaths, basically, broadly speaking. Um, there is an, oftentimes an assumption that Muslims are a particular source of danger, and they must be treated that way. We call this securitizing Muslims, right? We need to put policies in place and surveillance in place with law enforcement to, to keep Muslims at bay because they are a specific source of threat and harm to us. When actually, when you look at the data, you just take a couple steps back and look at the data, uh, there's no real reason to believe that. Muslims aren't the primary source of violence and violent deaths in terms of the United States. One of the reasons we draw that conclusion so frequently is 9-11. For some understandable reasons, that has shaped, if not warped, our understanding of the danger Muslims pose uh, to many people in the United States. But it's not borne out by the data since 9-11. 9-11 was an anomaly. It was not the norm. So, according to the Triangle Center in North Carolina, studies terrorism, since 9-11 in through 2015, so about a 14-year period, uh, 69 people in the United States have been killed by Muslim extremists. Again, that dates from after 9-11 through 2015. 69 too many. There's nothing wrong with having law enforcement pay attention to this and politicians taking this seriously, so long as it's proportional. In the same time period, 220,000 people have been murdered in the United States. But I ask you, where has our political energy been directed? Towards solving the second problem or the first? What do you run for political office on? Getting the murder rate down or fighting terrorism? In 2015, just one year, 134 people in the United States died from mass shootings. A lot of those mass shootings, by the way, were perpetrated by people who look like me. That's almost twice as many people who were killed in mass shootings in one year 
as were killed by Muslim extremists in 14 years. How many hearings on Capitol Hill have we had about mass shootings versus terrorism? How many people, again, get elected to political office, public office, by promising to solve the mass shootings in the United States versus deaths by Muslim extremists? And finally, on this slide, you have 254 people in the decade that were killed by right-wing extremists, oftentimes anti-government extremists. Again, racially speaking, people who look more like me. That's a lot more people than were killed by Muslim extremists. But most politicians will not bet their campaigns on trying to solve the problem of right-wing extremists or terrorists. So the data doesn't match the fear. And their political responses and the policies and counterterrorism responses to Muslims don't match the data. This is political, and we need to take that seriously. Last point on this larger point, uh, we look to Europe. Right Here's a nice graph of Europe for almost 50 years. This is most of my lifetime. It's easy to get some historical amnesia when it comes to terrorism in Europe. If we just remember the past several years, it seems like the only violence you encounter in Europe and have encountered in Europe for a long time comes from people with a Muslim background. And without a doubt, there are some bad years in the past couple of years, particularly the ISIS-inspired terrorism. And, and, and I, don't, I don't doubt that. I don't deny that. Take that seriously again, right? But this notion that Muslims don't fit into Europe because they're particularly prone to violence, and are a particular problem when it comes to violence, again, if you just take a couple of steps back and look at the bigger picture, also doesn't make sense. It doesn't help us understand terrorism, past or present. The blue on this graph represents casualties from starting from 1970 going all the way to 2017. The blue represents casualties from people kill, killed in terrorist attacks by non-Muslims. The red represents casualties from people killed in terrorist attacks with those from a Muslim background. There is some red on this graph. Take it seriously. Should jump out as she's pretty obvious. There's a heck of a lot of blue on this graph too, right? The 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, when terrorist attacks took place, and there's casualties more often than not, it was not a Muslim who was behind it. And that's not because Muslims were not present or living in Europe in the 1970s and 1980s, or 1990s for that matter. The percentage of the French population in the 1970s that was Muslim was higher then than the percentage of the American population that's Muslim today. Plenty of Muslims have been in Europe since the 1970s, in fact, earlier than that. But it's only after 9-11 that we see a significant change in terms of that red. The scholar wants to know why that is. I mean, my argument would be this is 9-11. This is the war on terror. This is the invasion of Iraq. This is geopolitical events and some of the discrimination and Islamophobia that they're triggering in Europe that is generating terrorist attacks. That doesn't justify the attacks. It helps to explain them, though. And it helps us to remember that in the grand scheme of things, in a not too distant history, the monopoly on terrorist attacks was not from people who were had a Muslim background. In fact, the years were the worst terrorist attacks in the past 50 years. Uh, we have three of them in the 1970s and 1980s, where the casualty rates exceeded 400 in a given year, or were overwhelmingly people uh, who, who were non-Muslim. By contrast, the closest you've gotten since 9/11 is 2004. We almost hit 200 that year, and that was the year of the Madrid, Madrid training bombings. So the casualties were not only quite numerous and perpetrated mostly by non-Muslims uh, in the first half of this graph, not longer, um, but the casualty rates were worse, significantly worse. Perspective. When I weigh in on this in public conversations, political discourse, that's all I'm asking. I don't think it's an unreasonable thing to ask. Some perspective, some context. When we have perspective, we have context, we have better conversations about terrorism, we have better conversations about the relationship between religion and violence. Much better than we're having right now, where most of us lack context. And certainly our elected leaders lack context. So that's the first reason, at least some examples of why uh, we should stop asking Muslims to condemn terrorism because of the false assumption that Islam is driving terrorism or that Muslims have a particular problem when it comes to this sort of violence. But that's clearly not supported by the data. The second reason, uh, not quite as uh, in-depth on, on this one, but you can read more about this in my book, as to why we should not ask Muslims to condemn terrorism is because doing so ignores the many instances in which Muslims do condemn terrorism. 
And in my book, one of the chapters is a chapter on Muslim condemnations and statements that Muslims make about terrorism. And I organize that chapter by theme, and I demonstrate how Muslims dig into Islamic texts and traditions to make their arguments against unjust violence and terrorism. And you're mo most welcome to read that. I'm not going to give any of that in my presentation. I'm simply going to say, why is it that we don't even know this? And I'm going to make this really outlandish claim, but I don't think it's outlandish at all, is that a lot of us are struggling with our Google skills, apparently. The thing is, we know how to Google everything today, don't we? I, I literally Googled the directions from Pittsburgh to here when I flew in. Because Elkins is not a place I normally end up in, but Google helps. In 10 seconds, I got the directions. If I want to make pumpkin pie or pecan pie for Thanksgiving, I can Google it and I can get a recipe. Again, in 10 to 15 seconds, depending upon your internet connection, right? I can Google directions to the local dog park. All of us know some basic Google skills without being experts in Google, per se. If that's the case, where was Google when Roger Cohen of the New York Times and Sean Hannity of Fox News were asking such inane questions? Where are the moderate Muslims? Why aren't they condemning terrorism? Here's a suggestion. Get on Google and Google Muslims condemning terrorism. It will take you 10 seconds or less to get a page full of hits where almost every site on that first page is a website that takes you to pages where you have examples, lots of examples of Muslims condemning terrorism. You do not need a PhD in this stuff to get the answer to this question. And yet we have prominent journalists going on cable news or the New York Times, in some cases prominent politicians doing this as if they can't get the answer literally at their fingertips. The first hit I get when I Google this is a website called Muslims Condemn, creatively named, right? Um, this was a site created last year by a Muslim college student who was tired of people asking that question, why aren't Muslims condemning terrorism? So she decided to go home and over a period of weeks, she created a, a database, a Google spreadsheet, with uh, it's about 712 page Google document with over 5,000 examples of Muslims condemning terrorism. I confess, this is not exciting reading. It'll take you days to go through it. You know, if you have a great novel at home, you're going to be more entertained by that than this. I'm just telling you it's the first hit to get. You don't even have to dig into the Google search results to find it. It took me longer to figure out how to draw a red circle around that first hit than actually get to get the hit. And that tells us something again about why don't we know this? It's not because we don't know how to find this information, but we just assume that we know the answer, or the general population knows the answer. It's a rhetorical question. Why aren't Muslims condemning terror? And shame on us. Shame on us if we can't figure out how to find the answer to this. It has nothing to do with what Muslims are or are not doing. I also, in the book, talk about not just verbal condemnations or written condemnations. I talk about actions that Muslims are taking. Muslims condemn terrorism not only in word but in deed. And I give examples of Muslims who serve in the U.S. military. About five to 6,000 soldiers are uh, Muslim in the United States military, potentially more. Muslims serve in European militaries. Muslims serve in law enforcement agencies. They serve in the NYPD. They serve in the Minneapolis Police Department, close to where I'm from. Um, I imagine they serve up in Pittsburgh. Uh, they serve in all sorts of organizations whose job it is to keep the public safe and or to fight in this war on terror that we've been fighting for so long. Doing the very things that they're often accused of not doing, they're actually doing. Sometimes they give their life doing that thing. So on your left is a man named Ahmed Merabeg. He uh, was a French police officer, a Muslim. And in January of 2015, he responded to a call in Paris that there was an attack on the offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. And if you don't know what Charlie Hebdo is, it is a satirical magazine that has often produced anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic content, not even uh, subtle stuff. So he responds to this call, and when he's on site, he pretty quickly comes face to face with the attackers. And he gets shot and wounded and falls to the ground, and then he gets shot at point blank range and killed. And the irony, of course, is that he died in the line of duty defending a magazine that regularly ridiculed his religion and ridiculed Muslims. 
Do we know his story? On your right is the grave marker of Captain Kamehameha Khan, and you might remember his name because in the realm of politics in 2016, it became common for a little while. His parents stood before the Democratic National Convention in 2016 and told the story of their son, again, a Muslim, who joined the army, joined the military, served his country, fought in Iraq, and died in Iraq. Died trying to protect fellow soldiers in Iraq. He was buried not just in any cemetery, but in Arlington National Cemetery. That is an Islamic crescent on his grave marker. It's not the only grave marker in Arlington National Cemetery that has an Islamic crescent. Do we know his story? And there are others like stories that don't make the, the, the evening news like his did during the, the, the Democratic National Convention. But Muslims are doing things, lots of things, when it comes to responding to terrorism. Muslims actually raise a lot of money to help victims of terrorist attacks or other unjust violent attacks. Um, this is true, was true after San Bernardino, it was true after Orlando, it was true after London and Paris, and it was true this week after Pittsburgh. A couple of Muslim organizations quickly started to raise money for the families of the victims uh, who died in the shootings in Pittsburgh over the weekend. Uh, I checked their website before I came tonight, and I think right now they have somewhere in the neighborhood of $226,000 they raised. Muslims are doing things to respond to violence. Whether Muslims are perpetrators even in violence or not, it doesn't matter, as was the case here. They've raised money to help uh, rebuild African American churches subject to arson in 2015. They helped raise money to restore a Jewish cemetery that was desecrated in St. Louis a couple of years ago. And again, they raised money after terrorist attacks. Are their stories told? Are their stories remembered? What they're doing? And this is the kind of stuff I deal with in the second part of the book. And again, why would you stop asking Muslims to condemn terrorism? Because we ignore all the things Muslims are already doing and assume that they're doing nothing. And again, that has nothing to do with what Muslims are actually doing. It has to do either with our ignorance in the majority population or, or our willful ignorance in some cases that we don't want to know because it helps us other Muslims. Keep them at bay, keep them as, as enemies, and not integral to the United States in the way we build our nation. The third reason, the final reason, in my opinion, the most important reason why we should stop asking Muslims to condemn terrorism is because it diverts attention from our own violent past in the United States and over in Europe, and in some cases our own violent presence. These are categories of violence that I think most journalists and most scholars would agree on that can be attributed to ISIS. Either things that they have done or things that they have tried to do, such as genocide, or maybe trying to get their hands on the materials for a dirty bomb, a nuclear weapon. So these are the categories used to describe ISIS. Most people will agree on it. I don't think this is a particularly controversial list. What I argue is that you can take every single one of these and dig into our past, and again, in some cases, our present, and you will find these apply to us as well, the non-Muslim majority, or the United States as a nation, or many of our European allies. Every single one of them is part of our own history. And I say that because it's important to recognize that sometimes we look to ISIS, and then we assume, well, this is something unique to ISIS, and maybe more implicitly, we're suggesting this is something unique to Islam. And I'm here to tell you these categories of violence are unique to no particular religion. We only draw that conclusion if we don't know our history. Or we ignore our history. Or that we're encouraged to forget our history. Which is one of the arguments I'll be making tonight. So I'm not going to go through all of these um, and give examples. I'm just going to go through some of them uh, to illustrate the challenges we have in recognizing that brutal violence, terrorism, I might call it at least unjust violence. This is, this is very much a part of our history. And some humility, perhaps, is in order as we talk about Islam and violence or terrorism, given our own history, and in some cases, given, given our own presence. Um, one thing I'll start with is this picture of the 9-11 Memorial Museum. I'm fascinated and very interested in the violence that we are encouraged to remember. And not only remember as individuals, but to remember publicly. There are certain kinds of violence that we are strongly encouraged to remember and commemorate. 
9-11 is the classic example, right? Massive museum and complex in lower Manhattan. If you've never been there, you can spend a full day there. It's overwhelming. It's an overwhelming place. Uh, and, and you can get lost in it, literally. The motto of 9-11, of course, is never forget. So this is violence we're not supposed to forget. And in case you are going to forget it, you go to New York, you're going to be reminded of by the size of this memorial. Violence we're encouraged to remember. Why are we encouraged to remember this violence? Because for 9-11, we see ourselves as the victims of unjust violence, of terrorism. So this must be commemorated. The thing is, what happens when we don't see ourselves primarily as the victims, but might recognize ourselves even faintly as the perpetrators? That's not violence we like to remember. That's not violence we're often encouraged to remember. Sometimes we're actively encouraged to forget it or to have it erased from public memory. So slavery, ISIS reinstituted slavery. They were roundly condemned for reinstituted slavery by a lot of Muslim scholars. But lest we think that that's some sort of barbaric practice that they do over there somewhere, we shouldn't forget that slavery is very much a part of our history. And we're not talking about ancient history in the Middle Ages. We're talking, by historians reckoning at least, modern history into the 19th century. What I have learned over the years of teaching as a college professor from my students is that many of them have gone to public schools learning a little bit about slavery. But if I ask them, is slavery an example of religious violence? Most of my students would say, no, that's not how they learn the episode of slavery. They're even a little bit hard pushed to think of it as an episode of violence, though it doesn't take much nudging to get in that direction. Slavery was an incredibly violent, brutally violent institution. But religious violence, they haven't been told the story in that way. But it's not hard to find lots of examples of Christians using theological texts and biblical texts to justify the institution of slavery. That wasn't a minor enterprise by the 19th century. It was a very significant one. Christians are a part of the story. I'm not saying Christianity caused slavery any more than I'm saying ISIS is, Islam is caused by ISIS. I'm simply saying that you can't tell the story of slavery, apart from telling the story of Christians and white Christian complicity and perpetuation of this institution. But we don't tend to tell the story that way. And a lot of my students don't know how it was justified by biblical or theological texts. And all, often very aggressively, certainly. When slavery comes to an end, a new wave of violence sweeps America to try to reinforce the racial caste system that had already existed under slavery. If slavery is not there to keep black people in their place, then what can be implemented to do that? Something called lynchings. And lynchings, as I say in my book, is a form of racial terrorism as far as I'm concerned. It's meant to invoke terror, to affect a certain social or political change, and to maintain a certain political and social order. And between the late 19th century and then the mid-20th century, it's debatable, but at least 4,000 people were lynched. Mostly, but not exclusively in the South. 4,000 people. And there are also lynchings that we just don't have record. In 2018, the Equal Justice Initiative, under the leadership of Brian Stevenson, opened the first national memorial to lynchings in Montgomery, Alabama. And I had the honor of visiting this uh, memorial early in the summer, along with my wife and my daughter. Uh, we, we literally went to Alabama just to do this. And it was an extraordinarily moving event. I haven't been as moved in a place like this since going to, say, the Holocaust Museum. And I haven't seen as many people visit a place like this and shed tears as I have since I've been to the Holocaust Museum. It's a profoundly moving place. My question is, why did it take so long to build it? It took 13 years to get that memorial up to 9-11. And more people died in lynchings than died in 9-11. Why did it take so long to build it? I can add this is also a much smaller structure. It didn't cost nearly as much money, and it didn't get nearly as much political buy. -in. in fact, uh, before I went down, I was reading some of the local news stories in the Montgomery newspaper about the openings of this event, how local residents in Montgomery felt about it. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of mixed feelings. But particularly for white residents of Montgomery that were being interviewed, it was not uncommon for them to say some variation of, well, I wish they really wouldn't dredge up the 
I find that phrase fascinating, dredging up the past. Because I dare say no one would say that about 9-11. Or 1776, for that matter. There are certain pasts that we love to dredge up, and there are certain pasts that we want to bury so deeply that we never have to come face to face with it in our public memory. Lynchings is one of them. In the book, I go into some detail about one particular lynching that has some meaning to my own life journey. It's a lynching that took place in Waco, Texas, about 100 years ago. A man named Jesse Washington was accused of murdering the wife of a farmer just outside of Waco. So he was arrested, put on trial. The jury deliberated about four minutes, declared him guilty. The verdict was announced. A white mob was waiting for the verdict to be announced. They drug him out of the courtroom, out of the courthouse, onto the courthouse lawn. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him along the way. If you've ever read the gospel stories about Jesus' crucifixion, this should sound eerily familiar. They strung him up, cut off his toes, cut off his fingers, castrated him. A lot of these body parts were passed around as souvenirs, and if that sounds gruesome to you, that actually was not uncommon. Photographs were taken from the mayor's office. This is taken from the mayor's office, helping the photographer get a good shot of what was going on. And the reason I show you this picture is not for you to fixate on the body of Jesse Washington. In fact, I recognize you can probably not see it very well from where you're sitting. That's on purpose. I want you to fixate on everyone standing around. 10,000 people showed up to this lynching in a city that scarcely had 30,000 people in 1916. 10,000 people. And I just want to ask the question, what religion do you think they are? Buddhists? Sikhs? Jains? Jews? Overwhelmingly, these are Christians. If you haven't spent much time in Central Texas, it's Baptist country. Although there's a lot of places in the South, I guess they can say that they're Baptist country. But Baylor University, the flagship Baptist University, then and now, was there in Waco, Texas. The reason I point this out, number one, is that a lot of Christians, and this lynching and many others, somehow had to find a way to fit this gruesome act that they were participating in into their theological and moral scaffold. We have to ask that question. How did they do that? And you say, well, they must have been setting aside their Christian faith. That's naive. They, they were making it work. Right? And we have to take that question seriously. Again, without me saying that Christianity is causing this. But Christians made it work. Christians perpetuated this. The other reason I tell this story is that I lived in Waco, Texas and served as a Presbyterian minister from 1998 to 2002 at First Presbyterian Church, located blocks from where this happened. Not once did I ever hear anyone tell the story. I didn't learn the story until after I moved. Not once when I walked downtown past the courthouse did I see so much as a teeny tiny little plaque with the name Jesse Washington on it. Waco didn't want to commemorate this violence. A lot of white Americans don't want to commemorate this kind of violence. These are not stories we want to tell. These are not stories we want to reflect upon. We don't want to do that kind of soul searching. What violence are we encouraged to remember after all? And where is the motto never forget when it comes to the sordid history of lynchings? Where does that only apply to 9-11? Torture? Yeah, ISIS has done a lot of torture. Really bad stuff. Torture, again, is not just something that they do. It's something we have done and done quite frequently. And I'm not talking just about the Crusades or the Inquisition or witch trials, though certainly there's plenty of torture that took place in those episodes. I'm talking about modern history. Obviously, Nazi Germany tortured. British and French empires tortured. The United States has tortured a good bit since the mid-20th century. We learned some of our core torture techniques from the Nazis. In the Vietnam War, we had the Phoenix Program, which was a torture program. 
meant to root out collaborators with the Viet Cong uh, over in Vietnam. We have sponsored the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia, which basically trained Latin American military dictators and military leaders in the art of torture. And then they went back to their countries and practiced that torture. So a lot of the torture that took place for decades in Latin America directly or indirectly can be traced back to the United States sponsoring it. And of course, what you're probably most familiar with is the war on terror, uh, Abu Ghraib, and the horrible pictures that came from Abu Ghraib. CIA black sites, that sort of thing. And by torture, we're talking about just a few examples that we've admitted to. Shackling, mock executions, beatings, strapado hanging, forcing prisoners to have oral sex with one another, urinating on prisoners, ice water baths, rectal feeding, rape, and of course waterboarding. And these are just examples of some we've admitted to. Uh, the full torture report has been redacted. I imagine there's some worse things to be found. In 2014, the U.S. Senate Intelligence Report came out, and it was the first time the U.S. government admitted to torture. It stopped using the euphemism of enhanced interrogation techniques. It was torture. <clears throat> President Obama very memorably said the following. We did some things that were contrary to our values. Talking about torture. We did some things that were contrary to our values. But were they contrary to our values? A Washington Post poll in 2014 revealed that close to three quarters of white Christians approved of the CIA's torture program in the war on terror. It's very much a racial division amongst Christians. White Christians are much more likely to support torture than people of color. And we can debate why that is, but that's what the, the data is showing us. So then again, I asked President Obama, was torture really against our values? Was this just a few bad apples, as Rumsfeld once said, letting off some steam. This has actually been part of our policy for a very long time. And as a nation, we have not come to terms with our sponsoring of our torture and our complicity in torture and the violence that we perpetuate, that we're all too willing to get to them when someone else is doing it. Genocide, ISIS has been accused of attempted genocide. Uh, John Kerry, when he was Secretary of State, made such a declaration. I think there is some merit to that argument, particularly targeting Yazidis, maybe Shia Muslims, among others. But again, genocide is not just something that ISIS has tried. It's part of Western history. Obviously, the Holocaust is a good example of this. Again, when I ask my students if they think of the Holocaust as a form of religious violence, well, they understand that in terms to the extent Jews were the particular targets of the Holocaust, that you might talk about as religious violence, but they don't think of the perpetrators in a religious sense, or using religious categories. But as the historian Doris Bergen has rightly noted, Christianity permeated Nazi society. Remember Germany, home of that Reformation thing, right? Uh, Christianity is not marginal to the history of Germany. It wasn't even in the 20th century. A lot of Christians were complicit in the Holocaust. Whether we know that story or not is a different question. But we can't tell the story fully without telling that story as well. German Christians and others supporting Nazi Germany, members of the party, right? Or otherwise being complicit or turning a blind eye. This is Protestants, this is even Catholics. It's not, it's not a pleasant story to tell, but should we not be telling it? Genocide, I should add, is just not something that they did over there. I would argue it's part of our history too. Um, targeting of indigenous populations, going back to Columbus. Uh, when Columbus first discovered America, 1492, and somewhere between 8 and 16 million indigenous people lived in what we think of as continental America. By the year 1900, there was barely over 200,000 indigenous people left. If we were to go with that higher number, 16 million as the starting number, that would be a depopulation rate of around 98%. <clears throat> and I promise you that all didn't come from disease. There was plenty of it that was an intentional genocide. Sand Creek Massacre, women and children in particular being targeted in this massacre. A lot of genocidal campaigns after the California Gold Rush in, Cal in, in, in the, the mid-19th century longer. Um, this goes back to the Puritans. Puritans frequently used genocidal language. And you know where they got that language from? The Bible. They often referred to Native Americans as Amalekites. 
I promise you, if anyone ever refers to another people as Amalekites, they are not complimenting. They're targeting. You need to learn your story about God's command to, uh, to Saul to wipe out the Amalekites. And what happens when Saul doesn't do so, right? But the Puritans were there to say, well, we're the new Israel. We'll get it right. And they were, they were re-envisioning their history in biblical terms. And we can debate that theology, and I certainly would. But we can't debate that that wasn't happening. It did happen. This is also a part of our history. Where is the equivalent, though, of the Native American genocide memorial? That would even come close to rallying what we have in 9-11. How many Native Americans had to die before we would create such a memorial? In 2012, the College Board, some of you college students might remember the College Board, AP exams, if that rings a bell. Um, college Board was putting together preparatory materials for the AP American History Exam. And in those materials, they included a discussion of the genocide of indigenous populations in America. And when politicians got hold of this, they pushed back hard, real hard, and lobbied and pressured and pressured. And finally, a couple years later, the College Board redid their materials, and they kindly edited that material out. You can't use the G word when telling this history. And when I asked my college students, in high school, did you ever hear the word genocide as applied to Native Americans? To a person, they would say no. If they heard that somewhere, they heard it outside of the public school classroom. It's not, it's not an issue that's taught. Why not? Finally, in a very difficult episode to talk about, weapons of mass destruction, as I had on that list, that's language we've used more in the 21st century. Um, a lot of anxiety for a long time about terrorist organizations getting their hands on nuclear weapons. Some of those fears might be found in some of them, not so much. Obvious example back in the 2003 when they uh, campaigned for, uh, to go to a war in Iraq. But we should call attention to the fact that the only country ever to use nuclear weapons to target the civilian population, mass numbers of civilians, was not a Again, a rogue terrorist organization. It was the United States. And it happened, of course, in 1945, August of 1945. Hiroshima on the left, Nagasaki on the right. It ushered in a new era. A few people would deny that. The end of that great war, the beginning of the Cold War. And the unleashing of a horrible weapon, as many of Truman and advisors reminded us. This is a horrible, horrible weapon. It has the power to do great, great evil if it gets in the wrong hands. The orthodox narrative as to why the bomb was dropped, the bombs, plural, was that it was to save hundreds of thousands of American lives, uh, to forestall an invasion of Japan, to save again American lives, and it was also added this was revenge for Pearl Harbor. And I'm all for debating that narrative from Truman, but Truman is the source of it. But it has become such a sacred narrative that it can't be questioned irrespective of what other historical knowledge we might have about the decision to drop the bomb, about people who disagree with Truman and his administration about the bomb, about the effects of the bomb on the population in Japan, and what that would have looked like, and even debating whether Truman was right in his estimates of how many American lives would have been saved. All oh, that's debatable, because we never had an invasion, right? So it's all conjecture. But can you debate? Well, the Smithsonian tried in 1995. 1995, the National Air and Space Museum was going to sponsor an exhibit of the Enola Gay, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the dropping of, of the bomb. So they got the fuselage, restored the fuselage, it looks beautiful, you can see it there on your left. And in the interest of having a full exhibit, they were going to have all sorts of information and halls that you would, galleries that you would wander through to learn more again about why Truman made the decision what sort of debates took place about the bomb, the history of how the bomb came to be, which is a fascinating history. Um, people who disagreed with Truman on this, and also the casualties in Japan, how people died, even some photographs of what some of those people who looked like who weren't fortunate enough to get incinerated initially on the initial blast. And some of those photos are gruesome, I'm not showing them tonight. Politicians weighed in. Veterans groups weighed in, President Clinton weighed in, and eventually 
the Smithsonian back off, if that makes sense. And they decided to scale it down to a piece of fuselage and a couple of plaques. The secretary of the Smithsonian apologized. Acknowledged that there's a lot of emotion tied to this event, which I recognize as well. And that what they were trying to do initially, but wrongly he now recognizes, was trying to analyze the event. And maybe their job wasn't to analyze history, but simply to bear witness to the people who fought on behalf of the United States in this war. An understandable motive, to be sure. But the debate was gone. It was not possible even to raise critical questions about Truman's narrative. This is not a story that we're allowed to talk about in that way. It's too sacred. It's too sacred and it's too difficult to think about the impact of this bomb on the other side. So difficult, in fact, that when President Obama tried to visit Hiroshima in 2016, the first sitting president to go to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, there were politicians who got very anxious. Sarah Palin and Donald Trump are two of them. They might be prone to anxiety, I don't know. Uh, Palin accused him of dissing our vets. Trump said he should spend more time concentrating on the, the victims, the casualties from Pearl Harbor, than from the dropping of the bombs, right? And the thing is, Obama didn't apologize for dropping the bombs. They were worried about that. He didn't do it. I'm still having trouble imagining a president in my lifetime doing it. We'll see. But he couldn't even show compassion and recognize the difficulty of this very complex event and how this was received and how it affected the history of the Japanese people. That's the kind of anxiety that we have about that narrative. It's not a story we can tell not in that way. So given this track record, why haven't those of us in the non-Muslim majority, particularly whites, white Christians even, engage in the amount of soul searching we've asked of our Muslim neighbors when it comes to violence? To answer this question, we have to know something about how Islamophobia works. And to get there, I want to borrow from the mind of a much more brilliant person than me, Toni Morrison. The author, who said several decades ago this about racism. Know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. What she was saying is that racism distracts African Americans by forcing them constantly to explain themselves, to defend their contributions to society, to defend their very humanity to a white population that never seems all that convinced. And she said, it's exhausting. I think this observation holds for Islamophobia as well because at its root, Islamophobia is also a form of racism. And allow me to read an excerpt from my book to elaborate on this point and to conclude the talk. Relentlessly asking Muslims to condemn terrorism is a distraction. It forces Muslims to explain themselves, to prove their innocence, to defend their humanity, yet the rest of us never seem satisfied with their efforts. So we keep asking the same question over and over. But asking Muslims to condemn terrorism distracts the rest of us too. It keeps us from facing our own violent history and from understanding how Western nations rose to power and prominence on waves of unjust violence. It keeps us from asking critical questions about how our current foreign policies or national security initiatives contribute to a violent world order. It keeps us from applying the word terrorist to violent people who look like me, who share my religious or cultural background, or who serve in my government. And when we are this distracted, we become blind to the hypocrisy involved in asking Muslims to reject the kinds of violence we would never be asked to reject, and I sure as hell would never be asked to reject. I think it's time to end the distractions. I think it's time to spend more energy coming to terms with our own history of violence and, dare I say, our own history of terrorism. And I promise you this, doing so will not kill us.
but it will help keep in check the feelings of cultural, religious, and racial superiority that drive false narratives of barbarous, violent Muslims versus civilized Westerners or peaceful Christians. A narrative we should know better about. A narrative we should know is a lie. And doing this will open the door for us to ask better questions of our Muslim neighbors. Questions that assume the best of them and not the worst, just as we would want others to assume the best of us and not the worst. Thank you.